Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here today. Yes, this is the topic of my talk I brought um, with me. And uh, I would like to start uh, by congratulating uh, everyone that feels attractive to La Studium uh, with this 25th anniversary. And uh, just to uh, make you aware that for me it's also a personal anniversary. I'm celebrating today five years of uh, very special friendship. And um, as we heard um, today that, or yesterday uh, about achievements of uh, Le Studium and great things that uh, uh, this organization has achieved in all these years, I think it's important not to forget that the ideas could be great, but you never progress without the dream team. And this is, guys, what you are. So really compliment to you, and I'm happy to be part of this today. So, um, we are talking about different things in this uh, conference. And I was, when I was putting up the slides, I was thinking how to not to lose you in my second slide, how to make sure that everyone is uh, uh, following me. And then I realized if we look around us, we find nanotechnology everywhere. So, just uh, unpacking your food, applying cosmetics on your face in the morning, uh, your phone, uh, our clothes, everything, and uh, of course uh, um, medicine and drugs as well. And even if you are not very technical, uh, we all know something about our bodies, so we are able to understand what I'm doing, which I think it's a great, um, uh, great field. Um, so now, today, we are in a nano age, we can definitely say that. But, um, and uh, the, the, the age is quite young. We are just witnessing its, uh, its progression. Um, it started actually um, in the uh, late 50s when uh, this um, uh, uh, physicist, uh, Richard Feynman, uh, mentioned in his speech that there is plenty of room at the bottom. What he meant actually is that we can uh, start building up uh, materials from bottom up, uh, from atom by atom, and then making special materials. Of course, it took a while until the concept was uh, taken by other scientists uh, and uh, until uh, Professor Norio Taniguchi coined it a uh, term of nanotechnology. And then yet, uh, that was not enough. Uh, it took again a while uh, when these two gentlemen uh, invented uh, scanning tunneling microscope that in fact enabled visualization of uh, individual <coughs> atoms. And then there was a uh, uh, explosion of, uh, of the field. Uh, I remember when I started um, in, um, in the 2000 uh, uh, in Delft University of Technology, everybody was talking about nano, just such as today everybody is talking about uh, artificial intelligence. You are not counted in science if you are not doing something in artificial intelligence. Those, in those years, the same was about nano. Uh, and uh, talking about medicine, um, I think um, I, I found that the first example of uh, its application in um, nanotechnology in medicine was this uh, DNA manipulated with man-made nanomachines. And that opened the world for nanotechnology uh, in medicine. So nano, what do we know about it except that it's very small, one billionth part of a meter. Uh, in Greek it means dwarf, but maybe if I put this cartoon, it is better to realize. So if a nanoparticle was the size of a football, a virus would be as big as a person and uh, uh, a donut would be as big as France. So this is how small we are talking. And uh, what about technology? So what is it actually? It is understanding and controlling a matter in the dimensions roughly from one to 1,000 nanometer. I put 1,000 because 200 nanometers is still nanoscale and this, these are more or less margins that we are talking about uh, in nanomedicine. It is a bottom-up assemble with atoms one by one, and then the product that arises from that is uh, stronger, smarter, cheaper, cleaner, and more precise. So nanotechnology is not a biology, it's not chemistry, it's not physics on their own. It is a combination of these all sciences that deal with uh, this such a small scale. And I also like uh, to pose the question, is nanotechnology science or engineering? So if we talk about the product that is built up in a smart way, then we would say engineering. But if we look at the structures that are possible by, by these, then I would say it is a 
art of a science. Then again, looking at examples in, nano, in nanomedicine, and this artery cleaning nanorobot, virus seeking nanoprobe, neutron replacing nanodevice, what is it? I think it is uh, art of engineering. So these terms are very, very connected and we are all hopefully uh, artists in our field. I am talk today about less pleasant uh, subject, which is uh, application of uh, nanotechnology in breast cancer. And just uh, some facts and figures to convince you how important it is. Uh, it is the most diagnosed cancer among women worldwide. And to keep uh, the men among us uh, awake, it also concerns men. One of 1,000 men are diagnosed with breast cancer. If you see um, the years, then amounts are growing, which has to do maybe with ecology, with our living style of living, but this is very, um, very uh, serious. 35% uh, involves breast removal, and it is mainly because it's diagnosed uh, in, in quite often, uh, up to 70% at advanced stage. What does it mean, advanced stage? It is uh, when uh, the tumor is no longer under control. So it is no longer uh, nicely localized that can be uh, removed easily. Uh, it, uh, there are meta metastases, so there, it requires different type of um, um, treatment strategy and uh, a different uh, survival rate, of course, uh, which is for uh, low and middle income countries uh, quite an issue because uh, it is usually diagnosed there too late uh, because uh, they don't have this, such a screening systems, uh, system like we have here in Western Europe. Um, which treatments of oncology um, are there? Um, today somebody asked me a question, do you think that uh, cancer is more uh, progress today because we know more and we don't know about what was happening in the past. That was you, Mikhail, right? Uh, yes, here is an example of the first woman in recorded history that was diagnosed uh, with breast cancer. On her request, um, her slave has amputated the breast. And of course, it was in 500 BC, she did not survive. But interestingly, this method was the only method up to the late uh, um, 19th century. And then, discovery of X-rays. This is the first example of ap application of X-rays to the breast. Of course, unsuccessful, but generated ideas that were picked up by some artist scientists, such as uh, Georges Chicotot, that uh, liked apparently to draw um, his uh, wild ideas uh, uh, in medicine uh, in, in the paintings, but did not get further than that. Um, another example in 19... 37, Sir Geoffrey Keynes tries to use uh, implanted uh, radioactive needles into a breast, and that's actually a prototype of a brachytherapy that is applied nowadays uh, quite uh, efficiently. Um, then uh, the systemic treatments uh, start to come up that we know today as chemotherapy, uh, hormone therapy, and teranostics. And teranostics, this is something which is very hot at the moment, which basically means that we try to combine a therapy and diagnosis and the same probe um, in, in the same nano uh, structure that uh, can do that. And that's, of course, very advantageous. So um, talking about nano-oncology, keeping in mind that there are different stages in cancer that can be treated, should be treated in a different way, what do we have here? Uh, surgery, of course. That's the first method. So how can nanotechnology assist surgery? Uh, where, um, of course, the, 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 the aspect of surgery is to open up uh, and cut out the tumor without leaving any traces that, that would generate, um, keep generating tumors. And uh, today, um, surgeons have, have this uh, tool in their hands, uh, which, is, uh, which are um, fluorescent tumor-specific nanoformulations. The point is that they are injected, and then if this is the, the old former uh, surgeon's view, here we have new view uh, the surgeon have uh, through the, uh, the, the, the camera uh, when the, the, the matter gets, or tumor gets excited and uh, uh, fluorescent basically. So you see uh, the surgeon would see this bulk tumor but would, would not notice these little uh, knots that are also important to be removed. So this is the aid in a surgery. Uh, in chemotherapy, hormone therapy, there is a delivery of, um, of uh, therapeutics. 
And here I have just one example of uh, liposome, which is uh, um, uh, the, the um, bilayer vehicle with aqueous core, uh, and that can uh, incorporate uh, uh, the hydrophilic drug or, or hydrophobic drug in a, in a bilayer. And delivery happens in a passive way, meaning that, uh, of course, tumor is growing. It needs uh, nutrition. Nutrition need to be supplied by the blood flow. And so the blood vessels are um, growing uh, intensively around the tumor. They don't have time to mature. So there are holes. And these leaky holes, they allow penetration of uh, uh, nano object through the holes and accumulation of those in a tumor. And this is a passive way of delivery of tumor, of, of drugs that can be used by such uh, vehicles. But of course, it is better when uh, uh, a drug is delivered um, uh, in a targeted way, so specific to, uh, to, the, uh, to the tumor. That means that uh, there are molecules used, which are called the targeting, targeting molecules, uh, such antibodies in this example. So they attach to the tumor, the drug gets uh, accumulated there, and the tumor gets destroyed. This ideal view, of course, but still better than uh, just unselective delivery. And when the drug is, uh, uh, is a, a, a radioisotope, then we are talking about radiotherapy. And, uh, and also, uh, we are also can talk about personalized medicine when we personalize this targeting molecule um, to, to, from patient to patient based on a, on, a, uh, on, a, on a genotype profile that I identified prior to the treatment. Of course, we are talking about very expensive treatment, but these are the possibilities. So radiotherapy is very interesting uh, uh, to understand how it works before I uh, start explaining what I do in my, uh, in my, with my group. So um, radiation therapy is actually DNA damage, which can happen in two ways. Um, direct damage, when ionizing radiation uh, breaks the, the DNA, or indirect, when it, uh, uh, the water is ionized and radicals are produced and they then attack DNA and so causing this indirect damage. And uh, what is applied in clinic today is external beam radiation therapy, which means that patient is lying there and uh, the tumor is identified, visualized, uh, treatment planning took place, and that's usually by MRI, magnetic resonance uh, imaging, and then the beams are directed to the tumor. Efficient, but you okay, can imagine that all the beams are passing the, the skin, the muscles, the, the, the fat uh, tissue, everything, and everything gets uh, uh, damaged. So there are some limitations on this. Um, you could say, okay, it is more convenient to deliver it inside out. Unfortunately, the mechanisms are not that developed yet. So the uh, internal uh, radionuclide therapy, where we inject um, radionuclide and let it accumulate uh, in a tumor is uh, just developing. And uh, today in clinics, it is used mainly as palliat palliative treatment and not as a main treatment. So the development of such, uh, such probes uh, is possible with uh, application of nanotechnologies, of course, taking into account the type of uh, radiation. We know alpha, beta, gamma radiation. Alpha, you can stop with your hand or with a piece of paper, but it, it has uh, 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 more energy. Beta has a longer uh, range, but it has less energy. So all these uh, pros and cons uh, need to be taken into account when we design uh, an application. So, doing that, we are thinking about this masterpiece, a nano probe, which is a carrier that can carry a drug or uh, um, an, an, a contrast agent unit uh, or radionuclide or fluorescent unit if we want to observe uh, some cell interactions, for example, and targeting vectors that brings it there. So there is plenty of work uh, for chemists, and that's how I uh, earn my salary, of course. Um, so we um, need them uh, also, such a constructs, to, uh, um, uh, to, to provide uh, this, this system with multifunctionality and preferably something that is easily exchangeable, that we can just choose whatever we want for this particular case. Now we're talking about personalized. Um, this is an example of a project that I did here uh, um, in, uh, with my Le Studium Fellowship in uh, CBM CNRS in, uh, in a group of uh, uh, Dr. Eva Todd. Uh, so the research that I brought here uh, was uh, on uh, nano zeolites, and these are beautiful materials. You can see how they look. 
uh, in, a, in a microscopic image. Uh, these are porous aluminum silicates that can be loaded with various um, metal ions, and these metal ions can have function. So they can be uh, either uh, optically active, and then they'll deliver luminescence signal, or they can be uh, loaded with paramagnetic gadolinium, and then they can act as uh, contrast agents for MRI, or they can be radio labeled with uh, zirconium, and then, uh, or zirconium or any other radionuclide, and then uh, serve as a, uh, as a radionuclide imaging agents or even uh, um, radiotherapeutic uh, radionuclides. So this work, uh, we have published uh, two papers on that, and uh, yeah, we, we know now more about these uh, uh, materials, and we know also what we need to do in order to improve them, because they're not perfect yet. Um, so um, these are the, the porous materials uh, that uh, serve um, the, the purposes of, uh, of imaging and therapy. Another project that uh, I have is uh, on uh, uh, using uh, magnetic nanoparticles of iron oxide. And iron oxide nanoparticles are, are known um, to generate dark contrast in uh, MRI. You see here, so these are the nanoparticles and these are image, image of breast with uh, nanoparticles inside, so the dark image. Um, so many interesting uh, properties these particles have, but um, very important, what is the decoration of these particles and how do we plan the strategy of uh, delivery of this uh, in, in vivo? So what we do, uh, and I do, did this with my pre, uh, PhD student that finished in January, so we um, provided these nanoparticles a bunch of things, uh, long polyethylene glycols in order to make the particles biocompatible, so the immune system does not recognize them immediately and puts them in a, uh, in a liver. Uh, then this is a folic acid molecule because uh, we know that breast cancer, they overexpress uh, receptors for folic acid, so this could be our targeting vector. And then fluorescein, just to make them fluorescent so we can see when they are accumulated in, a, in a tumor cells. Um, then another thing is uh, this uh, small uh, azide molecule that enables a click reaction in vivo. So, um, of course, it is not something that you, I expect you to know, but um, the idea of this uh, two-step targeting is that in the first step, these uh, nanoparticles are delivered in a, in, a, uh, in, in a tumor. They are there. We can see them in MRI. And then when we know that they are there and how many they are, we send this a radioactive uh, complex that then attaches and reacts with the, these nanoparticles on the surface uh, via click reaction, which is fast, selective, and most importantly, bioorthogonal, meaning that there are no analogs of this reaction in our body. So these two things are for sure uh, this reaction will happen. So in this way, we have a, a diagnostic part that we identify and localize the tumor, and then therapeutic part when we send this highly dangerous radionuclide in a very fast way to the tumor. So this is the idea. We have proved it in vitro. We see the reduction of a tumor uh, uh, upon incubation with, uh, with uh, I mean, the, the, the reaction happening with the nanoparticles. Uh, we know that at this, um, um, the, the radioactivity strength, this is uh, the most effective way. And uh, now we are discussing the next collaboration with the CBM to translate this uh, study in vivo and, and see if this indeed our concept works. So that would be a two-step targeting of, um, uh, of, of tumors. And then finally, uh, I want to show you my current project, uh, which I got uh, uh, quite big funding for that, also supported by, uh, by industry which is on uh, brachytherapy. So first, what is brachytherapy? I mentioned already insertion of uh, small, um, how to call them, uh, small seeds into, into a tumor. Here is, again, breast is an example because the project is on breast. And here is what is this uh, seed composed of. So there is a radioactive palladium, um, some titanium capsule. And uh, the point is that this seed is implanted uh, in a tumor surgically and uh, quite often stays there, especially when it's used for prostate cancer. These seeds just stay there forever. Uh, unpleasant for a patient, but to open up again is, uh, is again another invasive procedure. Uh, and so this radiation that comes out destroys the tumor. So it is kind of 
internal therapy, radiotherapy, but also external, because we are, don't really let things circulate uh, in, in the bloodstream. Um, to make this uh, work uh, better in Rotterdam, uh, they are uh, developing also uh, simultaneous hypothermia. So this is what they're famous for. Uh, this is one of their devices. This one is dedicated to a superficial uh, uh, tumors closer to the surface. So what happens, uh, there, is, there are needles uh, uh, of these seats inside and then the patient gets uh, hypothermic treatment. Point there is to uh, uh, help uh, tissue to, um, to react to the, to the radiation in an efficient way. Uh, so it is applied um, for 60, 90 minutes. Patient is, is uh, in this position. It is, of course, very hard, very demanding. Six to uh, uh, up to six uh, uh, sessions, and the temperatures are going uh, up to 43 degrees. So this is hypothermia. Um, another way is uh, thermal ablation. This is something else. Uh, in this uh, uh, way. Uh, a tumor is ablated, so destroyed. This is one-time treatment, tumor uh, heated up, destroyed. Of course, you can imagine that this approach should be very precise because, uh, okay, you can burn some more skin if it's a melanoma, but if it's a tumor uh, in, in some vital organs, you don't want to ablate the whole organ, right? So this is very tricky uh, procedure. In any case, both bra brachytherapy and hyperthermia, they are they have multiple side effects. They involve inflammation, uh, patient discomfort, because they are invasive techniques. So here we come with our nanotechnology. Nanoparticles for thermobrachytherapy. It's a very ambitious project, I have to say. First, we thought, oh, nanoparticles, we can make them. We make them all the time. Uh, we, make, we take uh, iron oxide nanoparticles, and we make them responsive for, um, uh, for magnetic field. So, Idea is when the nanoparticles are injected into a breast tumor, then the patient is exposed to alternating magnetic field, and nanoparticles, because they are magnetic, they can generate heat. And then, so the tumor gets ablated, and because we incorporate there um, a uh, radioisotope, palladium-103, uh, we um, just, uh, the, the, the patient gets this radio doses uh, when it goes home patient goes home. So it's just one stop shop treatment. Patient gets injection, uh, radioablation, goes home, and the remaining cells are getting uh, destroyed by radiation. Of course, uh, this is uh, a, a nice idea. So what, um, how far are we there? <clears throat> I have a couple of slides left. Uh, so we uh, um, uh, need to understand the, the, the mechanism of uh, magnetism, of course. Nanoparticles are composed, if we zoom in, are composed of iron, uh, iron 2, iron 3, and oxygen. And depending on this composition, they react differently in mag to magnetic field. What we need to happen is to, uh, that the, the heat is dissipated. So heat can dissipate by a Brownian relaxation, meaning that when you expose nanoparticles to magnetic field, they start uh, fluctuating in this Brownian motion, or nihil relaxation, which means that the spins, magnetic spins, re respond to magnetic field, and they are aligned or realigned. And in this way, the heat is created. Uh, so that, of course, uh, this uh, phenomenon, it depends on si particle size and all kind of uh, other uh, parameters. So here, our first approach, we thought we'd do it easy. We mix everything in one pot, uh, palladium and uh, iron, and we get nanoparticles. So we got beautiful flowers. Uh, here is palladium, and this is uh, iron. And they are magnetic, uh, but the heat that we can generate with these particles did not go higher than 45 degrees. Not good for thermal ablation, of course. So second attempt, we go in two steps. We, have, uh, we create first palladium seeds, and then we create uh, iron oxide shell. So here they are. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, this is an large, enlarged structure, so here, and there are dots, little dots, these are, this is, these are palladium uh, seeds inside. So we created them, and the temperature goes to 75 degrees. We might not even need 75 degrees, we might uh, heat them shorter time, or use a smaller amount, of, which is always convenient, of course. So we patented this uh, uh, strategy, and we also prepared radioactive analogs. Now, 
we are in the final stage when we face challenges like, okay, how to predict uh, the, 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 the extent of radiation that will be in the tissues, that we have a PhD student who is calculating with that. How to, uh, what is the radiobiological um, effect? So we have experiments, we created uh, these models, which are spheroids, uh, models of cancer cells, which are uh, better than just um, um, general um, 2D pellets, because we have here even necrotic core, just as, a, as, in, as in tumor, and we study the effects of uh, individual effects of uh, hyperthermia or ablation and therapy and uh, uh, combined effects. So there is plenty of data we are generating at the moment. And of course, uh, what we need to present in the end uh, is uh, uh, the, the final formulation. How do we want to inject uh, these materials? These nanoparticles need to be incorporated in, in a kind of organic matrix to make it injectable. And how much we inject? And where do we inject? In the middle of uh, a tumor or at the, in the corners? to cover everything and not damage the rest. So these are the questions that are there still. Um, uh, so we will continue with this subject, of course. And if um, um, talking about general conclusion, I thought um, just to be in line with, uh, with the team of our conference, uh, so we definitely understand more about the mechanisms uh, in cancer management. And we hope, of course, to improve the treatment one day um, because nanotechnology offers uh, enormous possibilities to, uh, uh, to create these materials. And uh, multifunctionality is the key, I think, uh, to, uh, to success. Uh, and the biggest challenge, uh, you might be surprised, but the biggest challenge for me is to find a common language between experts in different disciplines. We need to be able to talk to the doctors, make them realize what is important, we need the input from the clinicians to, in order to find out what is important so we can work on it to create something, uh, uh, something good. And this uh, good, uh, what, what it will be, the future will show, of course. Uh, another challenge that we, I didn't mention, preserve. But preserve, I guess, challenge is how we preserve our health. So that is the, the most challenging question. So with this, I wish you all to be healthy. Uh, and these are people that I want to thank for everything that I do uh, with my group, a uh, um, bunch of people from, uh, from CNRS, of course. I keep collaborating, and uh, thanks to Le Studium for this possibility to do my research. Thank you very much.